In this video, we'll be discussing the concept of limiting reactants. This is an extension of a regular stoichiometry problem, so if you have not yet covered stoichiometry or don't feel comfortable with that topic, I recommend reviewing that work before continuing. Let's start by going over a quick list of our learning objectives today. Uh, first of all, we're going to start with a review of stoichiometry itself. Uh, I want to make sure that this is an idea that's fresh in your mind, so we'll go over a really quick problem. Uh, once that's done, we'll then dive right into the idea of identifying what a limiting reactant is conceptually, and then move into how this limiting reactant concept affects the stoichiometry calculations that we'll be doing. Uh, the good news is we're not going to be doing any new mathematics, but we will be using the stoichiometry in a bit of a different way. Last but not least, we'll end up with a uh, quick practice problem uh, that's going to kind of walk you through the process, and obviously we'll do many more of those practice problems in class until you guys are comfortable. Uh, and the picture on the bottom of the page here is uh, kind of an example of this limiting reactant process. Uh, we'll be using it later on as a way of kind of like highlighting the problem before we dive into the actual chemistry. What we have here is an example of a stoichiometry problem uh, using a very specific reaction known as the Haber reaction, a reaction used to synthesize ammonia, which was part of the agricultural revolution that happened both in Europe and the United States, or at least it kind of started that process. Uh, anyway, the problem reads, how many grams of ammonia would you expect to produce by completely reacting 100 grams of nitrogen gas, which is this guy right here, with an excess amount of hydrogen gas. So the two chemicals we're interested in are the nitrogen and the hydrogen. If you want practice with stoichiometry, feel free to pause the video and give this problem a try. Uh, but otherwise, I'm going to go over the answer very quickly uh, in the context of, again, just reminding you how these problems work. So here's the math worked out in a dimensional analysis problem itself. Uh, we started with our 100 gram sample. Uh, we recognize that the first step as always is to convert this value here, whatever unit it's in, into the units of moles so that it'll match with the mole to mole ratio later on. In this case it was grams to moles, so we looked up the molar mass of uh, nitrogen, multiplied it by 2 because it's N2 to get the mass of 28.0134. Once we have moles of nitrogen, we use the mole-to-mole -mole ratio from the balanced chemical reaction. The coefficient in front of nitrogen is 1. The coefficient in front of the ammonia is 2, which is where these numbers came from. And then last but not least, we converted the answer from moles of ammonia into grams of ammonia using its molar mass from the periodic table to find out that we would make 121.6 grams of ammonia if we completely reacted the 100 grams of nitrogen gas we started with. Again, if what I just did seems mysterious, if you couldn't keep up with that, you need to go back and review stoichiometry before we can proceed further with what a limiting reactant problem actually is. Now here's where we turn the corner and start talking about something a little bit newer. Uh, notice this is the same exact problem we had before, but instead of saying 100 grams with excess hydrogen gas, now I'm giving you a quantity of hydrogen gas to work with, in this case 25 grams. Now when the reaction runs, it's going to use our 100 grams of nitrogen at a certain rate, it's going to use our 25 grams of hydrogen at a certain rate, and the question we need to start answering then is which one of these two compounds is going to run out first? If it's not the nitrogen, then the math we did in the previous problem in this case won't work anymore, uh, and we'll have to do some extra math to figure out what the actual answer is. So the real question, if we want to put this down on paper, is we will, will we still use the whole 100 grams of nitrogen, or will the hydrogen run out first? And again, if that hydrogen runs out first, we will stop the reaction before this 100 grams of nitrogen is used, and as a result, we won't know the quantity of reactants used. This is the new complexity that's introduced in a limiting reactant problem, is not only doing the stoichiometry to predict the product, but first identifying which one of these two values is the right number to start the problem with based on the concept of limiting reactants. So let's dive into what a limiting reactant actually is. A limiting reactant is the reactant in a chemical reaction that runs out first. And it's very important to identify this because it establishes a couple key ideas for us. First of all, when the first chemical runs out, the chemical reaction has to stop. If we have the reaction A plus B, reacts to make chemical C, we need both A and B present to make our new substance. As soon as any one of these is gone, the reaction necessarily stops. As a result of the reaction stopping, it's now going to limit whatever chemical runs out first, in this case B right out, right? This is going to now limit how much chemical C could be formed. We still have leftover A there, but it doesn't matter because we don't have any B to react it with. So the B is going to limit the amount of product formed.
We can also say that chemical B is completely used. So if I tell you how many grams of chemical B was put in the flask, you know that all of those grams were converted into chemical C. Chemical A, our mysterious chemical here, wasn't completely used. If I put 100 grams in the flask, we don't know how many of that 100 grams was actually consumed in the reaction itself. Last but not least, and this is the most important part, we'll put a little star here. Whatever is the limiting reactant in your problem should be used to predict the product's form, so the amount of product. Because we know we actually used all of that number, the value we get with chemical B is a good value to predict how much C should be formed via stoichiometry. All the other reactants then are considered to be non-limiting reactants. We will not use them up. In fact, we would describe them as being the reactant in excess, which, by the way, you've seen in older stoichiometry problems when I use that term excess. You've now mathematically identified which chemical is in excess, and that excess chemical cannot be used to predict the amount of product formed because we do not know how much of the mass that we put into the reaction. We don't know how much of that was actually used and how much of it is currently left over. So because we don't know that, the non-limiting reactant is not something we do math with yet. Uh, as you notice, I do have the word yet here. When we get into class, we will talk about more complex versions of this problem where you actually can use that value, but we'll tackle that when we get there. Let's talk about an analogy with something that's a little simple to work with. We'll talk about cars. Uh, we can write a chemical reaction, quote unquote, for building a car. Uh, we can say to build a car, it's going to take one car body plus four car tires and that's going to react to make one car. So just like in a chemical reaction, we have coefficients here that are going to tell us how many of each ingredient we need and how many products we're going to make in the process. Well, if we look at the equipment we have now to work with up here, we have eight car bodies. And if we have eight car bodies, that's going to allow us to make eight cars because each time the reaction runs, it's going to use one car body. So assuming every single car body is used, we'll get eight cars as our product. However, the reaction doesn't just rely on the number of cars we have, it also relies on the number of tires that we have. We have 48 tires, it takes four tires per car, which means with the tires, we should be able to make 12 cars. Now, here's where the limiting reactant process comes into play. Because we're going to run out of car bodies when we make the eighth car, when I go to make my ninth car, I will have plenty of tires to get the job done, but I won't have any car bodies. As a result, regardless of how many tires we have, we will only be able to make a maximum of eight cars in this particular experiment, and we will also expect to have 16 or four cars worth of tires left over. Adding in more tires is just going to improve or increase the amount of excess we have. It won't fix the number of cars. Therefore, we can say that our limiting reactant in this particular reaction are the car bodies themselves, and we could say that the tires then are in excess. So it doesn't matter how many tires we, are, we have, we're going to predict the amount of product we're going to make based on the amount of car bodies we have because it limits the car building process. We can do the same exact discussion that we did before with a chemical reaction, but the problem is, is it gets much more complicated uh, than it was with the picture with the cars. Not only are we using the two chemicals, nitrogen and hydrogen, at different rates. We're using the hydrogen molecules three times faster than we're using the nitrogen molecules, but you also have to keep in mind that the nitrogen molecules have a mass of 28 grams approximately per mole, and the hydrogen molecules have a mass of approximately 2 grams per every one mole. As a result, not only are we using the grams at a different rate, but a gram of hydrogen constitutes a much larger number of molecules than a gram of nitrogen was. What I'm trying to get out of here, and what we'll talk about more on this other slide, is that the limiting, deciding which one of these limiting is the limiting reactant is even more complicated because now there's two factors that are affecting what these values mean. So what we're going to need to talk about in the next couple slides is some mathematics that we can use to first determine which one of these is really limiting, and then ultimately determine how much of the product was really formed. So again, the take-home message, with a chemical reaction, this process unfortunately a little more complex. So let's get to the actual meat of the matter then, determining what the limiting reactant is. So to determine the limiting reactant, as I said on the previous slide, is something we need to do with stoichiometry calculations. And it is very important to note 
that it is non-obvious, meaning I can't just look at numbers and see, oh, this number is bigger and that number smaller. This guy, the smaller one, must be the limiting reactant because they're used at different rates and because the mass per molecule is different from molecule to molecule. A gram of molecule is not the same thing across the board. What we need to do, and this is a bit of a process uh, that you can use to help figure this out, so we can describe this as being a process here. We need to assume, for the sake of mathematics, that each reactant is going to be our limiting value. And this is just for the sake of the argument we're going to make. Uh, we're going to choose one of the products, and we're going to do stoichiometry to predict how much of that product is formed. Now, you'll notice I have this little thing here that says look ahead. Typically, in a limiting reactant problem, I'm eventually going to ask you to predict how much a particular product is formed. Look ahead to what that problem is, or what that product is, and use that as your product for this prediction process we're about to do. Otherwise, you're going to have to do a third stoichiometry calculation later on to figure out the actual answer for that part. What you're going to do, and this is the key step here, is you're going to calculate the amount of this product formed with each of the initial starting values. So we said we'd assume each reactant is a limiting reactant. We're going to do multiple stoichiometry calculations, assuming each one is limiting, and we're going to get multiple answers for how much of the product is formed. What you're looking for is the reactant that yields the least amount of product. Whichever one yields the least amount of product must be the one that runs out first. It must cause the reaction to stop before the other reactants do, and as a result, we get the least amount of product. That substance is your limiting reactant. That's the one that's going to limit the process. All the other chemicals, all your other reactants would be excess. As of now, we're not worried about those. So let's put this process into play. What I have in front of you is the exact same question we had back from the beginning of the slide, predicting how many grams of ammonia we would expect to form by completely reacting 100 grams of nitrogen with 25 grams of the hydrogen gas. So we're interested in the amount of nitrogen or ammonia we're going to form, which is this guy right here. We have a starting value for our nitrogen and a starting value for our hydrogen gas. At first glance, we can see we have a lot less hydrogen gas than we do nitrogen. You might be tempted to say, oh, hydrogen must be our limiting reactant. But keep in mind, the nitrogen is like 14 times heavier. So more nitrogen gas, mass-wise, doesn't necessarily mean we have more molecules to react. But also keep in mind, we're reacting this three times faster. So again, not obvious which one of these is the limiting reactant. The only way to figure this out is by doing a whole bunch of stoichiometry. Again. If you feel like you know what you're supposed to do right now, pause the video and give it a try. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to go through the steps of the calculations uh, and make sure that it all makes sense. So we're going to start by doing a stoichiometry calculation with each of our initial values, one for nitrogen and one for hydrogen. The one for nitrogen is exactly the same as the one we did earlier in the class. Uh, and We found out from before that we would get 121.6 grams of ammonia if we reacted all 100 grams of nitrogen. We're going to repeat this process, but instead starting with the 25 grams of hydrogen gas, and we should get another stoichiometry problem that looks like this. Convert the hydrogen to moles. We use the appropriate mole-to-mole -mole ratio for hydrogen to ammonia, and we're going to convert the answer then back into grams again. And if this were used, if the whole 25 grams of hydrogen, we would be able to create 182.4 grams of ammonia. What we can see from this is that this reaction produces a smaller amount of ammonia than this reaction does. What this means for us is that the ammonia is going to run out first and therefore is the limiting reactant. And the amount of ammonia, or the, amount, the nitrogen is limiting, the amount of ammonia then we would form would be the 121.6 grams. And it actually turns out that this number here is kind of meaningless for us. It doesn't do anything because we'll never be able to react the 25 grams of hydrogen because the nitrogen will run out before that happens. Meaning we'll have some, the product then will have 121.6 grams of ammonia in our flask. All the nitrogen will be gone on the flask and we'll have a little bit of this leftover hydrogen, a little bit of the 25 grams remaining. Later on, we'll actually be able to talk about how to calculate how many grams of hydrogen are remaining. But for now, we just have some excess hydrogen. What I want you to notice globally, even if the, this may, didn't make a whole lot of sense, is that all we've done here is two stoichiometry calculations instead of one. We did a stoichiometry calculation based on this starting value, a separate stoichiometry calculation this, based on this starting value, and then we simply compared the answers. Uh, again, we'll go over more of these in class, and hopefully if you are struggling with this still, that'll clear some of that up. 
So let's wrap this up. Uh, at this stage of the game, what you should be able to do, uh, definitely still stoichiometry. Uh, if you're still struggling with that, like I keep saying, practice, practice, practice. Uh, you should also be able to identify when a stoichiometry problem is also a limiting reaction problem. And maybe we didn't talk about that quite enough, um, but if it wasn't obvious, the thing you're looking for is two or more starting values. When there are multiple starting values, that means you don't know which of the chemicals is going to run out first, and as a result, you have to treat it as a limiting reaction problem as opposed to a plain old stoichiometry problem. And then last but not least, you should be able to do what we did mathematically. Identify the limiting reactant using our stoichiometry and be able to calculate the amount of product form, which is yet more stoichiometry. Uh, we'll try more of these in class. Uh, obviously, if you have questions about what you did, please write them down, bring them in. I'll try and address all of those, and we'll hopefully walk away with a pretty solid understanding of how to do this mathematics.